ya pasó, ya pasó, Tocayo, ya pasó. ¿Qué pasó? Pues, se extrañó AMLO. Pero sí está, míralo. Ah, bueno, es lo mismo, no es lo mismo. Oye, mira, para que no lo extrañes, precisamente nos trajimos a un AMLO, pero que no habla español, es un AMLO británico. ¿Y este sí habla de corrido? Y este sí habla de corrido, ahorita lo vas a ver. Británico. Ahorita lo vas a ver, ni más ni menos. Es, algo, es ¿no? una leyenda ya en Inglaterra. Ah, sí. Mira, aquí está. Ya. Ah, ya llegó. ¿Quién es? Ya está aquí. Sí. Oh, oh. Jeremy Corbyn. Oh. Qué gusto. Qué gusto. Qué gusto. Qué gusto. Qué gusto. Qué gusto. Son diablitos. Son los chamucos. Chamucos de Oaxaca. Ah, Pequeños ah, diablos. Qué bueno, quiero decir que es un verdadero orgullo y un honor <risa> tener aquí a, eh, a un personaje tan respetable y tan serio como Jeremy Corbyn, al que le gusta jugar con los muñequitos <risa> todavía, me parece fantástico. Y eh, es fantástico. Es decir, yo quiero decir, Jeremy Corbyn, es para mí la figura más respetable de la, de la escena política de la Gran Bretaña. Mm -hmm. Es de veras un honor. Por favor, regresa a Inglaterra conmigo. <risa> <risa> para, para la publicidad. Okay. Haré lo posible, venga, venga. haré lo posible. <risa> Oye, no, este, te queremos eh, eh, preguntar este, varias cosas. ¿no? Es decir, eh, nosotros hemos visto con mucha preocupación lo que está pasando actualmente en Gran Bretaña. Mm. Tú llevaste al Partido Laborista a una política muy progresista y avanzó mucho la izquierda en Gran Bretaña cuando tú estuviste uh -huh. al frente del Partido Laborista. Esto ha cambiado, soplan vientos distintos y lo que hemos visto incluso con mucha preocupación es un giro a la derecha del Partido Laborista y hemos visto además brotes de racismo impresionantes en Gran Bretaña. Uh -huh. ¿Nos podrías dar tu visión de qué es lo que está ocurriendo en Gran Bretaña actualmente? ¿Qué pasa con el Partido Laborista? ¿Qué pasa con Gran Bretaña? ¿Por qué eh, hay este rebrote del racismo? Muchísimas gracias por sus preguntas. Ahora me hablamos en inglés. Por es favor. Per... Inglés es más perfecto de mi español. Perfecto. Muy bien. Thank you for having me on your program. It's a great honor and a pleasure to be here. Um, your questions about how Britain has moved to the right and how there is a rise of the right and racism across Europe are very, very important. I <clears throat> led the Labour Party until 2020 and in the two general elections where I led the party we got more votes than the Labour Party received in the recent general election. But Britain has a peculiar electoral system, which uh, depends on what's called first past the post, which means that um, it's possible to be elected on a very small proportion of the vote, providing the other parties are split. And so um, Labour has won a general election with an enormous majority on less votes than I got, much less votes. And um, when I was leader of the party, we had 600,000 members and a radical agenda, which was about promoting peace and justice around the world, human, human rights and um, environmental stability. And no hay nada más radical que eso. Pues. Yes, um, and then on the domestic policies, essentially they were about tackling the grotesque levels of inequality within our society by raising wages by empowering trade unions and workers' rights and um, investing a lot of money in education and a totally free health service, uh, including ending university debt and uh, university charges. So there were a lot of issues that were very popular with much of the public, very unpopular with the powerful and the rich and the wealthy. And so I received... Um, years of media abuse, most of it personally directed towards me and my family. And um, <clears throat> it's quite hard to get a political message past the levels of personal abuse that we were receiving. So we, there is an issue which we've got a debate on the left about the power of media to um, not only destroy individuals, but I don't feel destroyed by the way, uh, but also to 
limit political debate and the aspirations of people. After I had stepped down as leader of the party, um, a new leader has been elected, Keir Starmer. A large number of members have left the party or been expelled from the party. And despite all the promises he made about increasing democracy in the party, it's gone in absolutely the other direction. And the, um, he promised to maintain the anti-austerity redistributive policies that I'd introduced. All of that has changed. And so we now have a Labour Party that presents itself as the party of business. It, that's how it presents itself, whereas I presented the party as the party of the community and of workers, because that's where my politics are and what I believe in. Um, the rise of the far right in all societies, USA, and particularly across Europe, is occasioned by a number of things. One is that there is a lot of racism in history, in society, in language, in culture, and it's very easy for right-wing politicians to always blame a minority. And even in the recent general election in Britain, even the Labour Party started blaming people from Bangladesh. And they, they started blaming minorities. Um, and I just felt utterly disgusted by that use of language. Yes, there are numbers of refugees in Britain and across Europe. They're there for a reason. Where do they come from? Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Libya. And what's all those countries got in common? Every single one of those countries has been at war with Britain supplying the arms and dropping the bombs along with the USA. So we're blaming people who are victims of war for seeking a place of safety. I find that utterly disgusting. And uh, I, um, as you know, um, was debarred from being a Labour Party member. And then I was reinstated in the party, unanimously, by the way. And uh, I was then debarred from the parliamentary caucus of the Labour Party. Um, and then on a decision taken by the current leader of the party, it was said I was not fit to be a member of parliament. Eso es un honor, ¿no? It's quite a, <laughs> quite, es un honor, a, quite, francamente. Quite a, quite a thing to say. I mean, my view is the people should decide who is fit to be a member of parliament or who is not. So they said I could not even be considered to be a Labour candidate for the area I've represented since 1983. I said, OK, let the people decide. So I presented myself as an independent candidate. We had no money, we had no organisation, and we started from zero. And in five weeks, we won the election. We mobilised people. We had thousands of volunteers, and we won. And in my election campaign, I said, Refugees are welcome. I support the Palestinian people and I want a ceasefire and peace in the Middle East. I want an end to arms supplies to Israel to stop the bombing of Palestine. And I wanted public ownership of rail, mail, water, all these issues. And housing for all. And we won. Jeremy, una vez escuché que comentaste que un periodista sueco te preguntaba sobre tus eh, propuestas de gobierno y cuando se las dijiste, él dijo, bueno, es lo que hacemos en Suecia, es lo que sucede en Suecia. Mm. ¿Por, mm. Qué, ¿Por qué llaman radical a alguien que propone esas cosas? ¿Qué, qué es lo que sucede en, en, en una parte importante de sociedades como la de Estados Unidos, como la de Gran Bretaña, en que personajes como Bernie Sanders o como tú son considerados radicales, hasta comunistas? ¿Qué, yeah. ¿qué pasa ahí? I, th I think it's a very fair point. The um, journalist who came uh, was actually very pleasant and very interesting. He said, oh, God, I thought I got a scoop here. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, I'm sorry. It's all <laughs> boring stuff about redistribution of power and wealth and ending poverty and homelessness and so on. He said, well, we've done all that. But why are you so far behind? I said, well, <laughs> we had Reagan and Thatcher big time in Britain and the USA. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, after a couple of years of our campaigning to end austerity and redistributive politics, the Financial Times, on one of its Saturday editions, 
said, and I was very touched by this, they said the debate about ending austerity is a very important one. And those people that want to see an end to austerity and redistribution should thank Bernie Sanders and Jeremy Corbyn for giving it some currency, for giving the whole ideas some currency. And it does, you're quite correct in your question, it shows just how far economic thinking has gone that um, in the 50s and 60s, the top rates of taxation in the USA were much, much higher than they are now. They were in Britain much, much higher. There was less homelessness, less poverty, less inequality, less injustice in all societies. Thatcher and Reagan produced the idea of trickle-down economics, ripping off of the public sector, handing it over to the private sector, and millions, billions have been made in profit from selling off what were public assets, almost on the same scale that Yeltsin did in Russia in the 1990s, is that's, that scale of it. So what I was doing was actually just starting a process of redressing that imbalance. But you know what? There's a, a lot of people have made a lot of money, and it's all holed up in, ta in tax havens around the world, and they've made it largely at the expense of the public sector. So. They don't like it. They don't like it when you start uh, all these issues. And um, I'm proud of the policies we put forward, proud of the debate we put forward, and proud of the way we mobilize people. But it's not all doom and gloom. It's not all over. It's not all finished. This is not a funeral. Mm -hmm. <laughs> of course not. No. Thank you. Thank you. you all, we're all agreed on that, I assume. Yes, of course, of course right. not. It's about hope for the future. All those people that were mobilized around the Bernie Sanders campaign in the USA, all those people that we mobilized in the Labour Party, and all these young people that are mobilized on the left across Europe, what are they doing now? They're opposing racism in every form. Mm -hmm. Those wonderful young people in Berlin, on the night the AFD gained seats, they went out down the Unter den Linden and said, not in our name. Mm -hmm. Muy, well done, them. Muy optimista del, del Absolutely. Futuro, totalmente. Of course. Of course. Look, um, young people like me have to be optimistic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> lo entiendo. <laughs> Nuestra generación así sí, es. Él, él lo entiende perfecto. <laughs> lo entiendo perfectamente. <laughs> I believe in intergenerational solidarity. Yo también creo en la, en la solidaridad intergeneracional. My life is one of education of you guys. <laughs> and, but also, another issue that's happened. Now, huge international events shape generational thinking. My mother and father met in support of the Spanish Republic in the 1930s. Mm. That was their cause. It was their cause. La lucha antifascista. Sí, la lucha antifascista. That's how they met. That's how they came about. And then, if you like, my generation um, came together opposing the Vietnam War mm -hmm. and the horrors of it. And like my mom and dad, who were denounced as um, pro-communist insurgents or something, for, merely because they stood up for democracy in Spain, I was accused of all that sort of stuff for standing up for the people of Vietnam. That anti-Vietnam War movement grew massively. The next generation was then about um, the war in Iraq. I remember going to the USA January 2003. It was freezing cold. We had a march. Um, to Newport, to the um, naval dockyard from, Washington, from the center of Washington. And I was on that march. It was absolutely freezing cold. And I was such admiration for people that had come from small right-wing Midwestern towns, driven all the way to Washington just to march against the Iraq war. And then we now have the global solidarity for Palestine. And uh, we've now had 15 national demonstrations in Britain. I've been on all of them, of course. And the biggest one, we had almost a million people marched on the US embassy. So those people that were mobilized politically in party politics, if you like, they haven't gone away. They're still there. Those lessons have been learned. And what we have to do in politics is understand the historical process. And do you know what? One day there'll be a ceasefire. One day, the Palestinian people will be able to live in peace. One day, the people of Lebanon will be able to live in peace. And one day, the arms trade will be under some control, not under the way it behaves at the moment with this massive influence on world politics. 
So I'm full of optimism, but you have to educate people. Can I say something about a book I've written? <laughs> a ver. Thank you. Cuéntanos de tus libros. This book, see? Monstrous the, Anger of, the, of, the, of guns. the Guns. And what it comes from is a poem from the First World War, a poem written by a great First World War poet called Wilfred Owen, who fought in the First World War and was horrified by it. And the line we put is, what passing bells for those who die as cattle, only the monstrous anger of the guns. So those soldiers that were dying, all they heard was gunfire. What we've produced is a book, it's a global book, it's from people from the USA, from uh, Britain, from India, from South Africa, India and so on, have all written about their experience of the power of the arms trade. We've produced this book, a whole bunch of us, and um, we are promoting it with book tours in Britain and Europe, and of course here if necessary, uh, as a way of discussing how we can develop our economies, not by investing in weapons of mass destruction, but by dealing with the environmental disaster and the cultural disasters that we're facing at the present time. So what I'm involved in is partly political education through the Peace and Justice Project, which I founded after the election, but also working with Progressive International. Progressive International is a um, social movement of political parties, of unions, of protest groups, of social groups, and we're giving practical solidarity about voters and workers' rights. We worked very hard in Brazil before Lula's election. We worked very hard in Colombia, in Bolivia, in Peru, in South Africa, India, and of course on Palestinian issues. And we have a huge range of supporters and affiliates, and we have a global cabinet that meets once a month by Zoom. It's fascinating looking at everybody's background, look what's on their bookshelves, look what's out of their windows behind them. But we've got people on one call from the Americas, both North and South, from Africa, from India, from Europe, and so on. And that has got to be the way forward, global solidarity for redistribution of power and wealth. Empower and inspire people. Mm -hmm. that's, what, that's what we young people have to do. Exactly. Look at you. Sí. La chaviza. La chaviza, la juventud. Sí. Y lo que tenemos que hacer Nuestros es, jóvenes. Nuestros jóvenes. Pero también tenemos que hacer un corte comercial, un una, corte, pequeña, una pausa. pequeña pausa y regresamos. No te vayas, Jeremy, por favor. Y seguimos aquí en El Chamuco TV y platicando con Jeremy Corbyn, que es como nuestro AMLO, pero de Gran Bretaña. Y estamos muy contentos de tenerte. Y estábamos platicando de unos libros. Estabas platicando incluso de poesía, pero cuéntanos un poquito más. Well, I was talking before the break about the monstrous anger of the guns. And um, the project we set up, the Peace and project, uh, Justice Project, which is closely working with Progressive International, we brought people together. And uh, there's a Mexican connection here, a very big Mexican connection. OK. My wife, <laughs> Laura Alvarez, okay. is obviously Mexican and very proud to be Mexican. And she is the International Secretary of the Peace and Justice Project. She worked with some very important um, peace activists from around the world and uh, academic thinkers about the arms trade and coordinated this book in record time because getting 20 writers together to stick to a timetable agree on editing and agree on publication is no, 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 not easy. And she was there with a rod of iron telling us your papers must be ready on time and this is the edit we're doing and so on. And so we got the book out and then one day I walked in the office and I said, what are all these boxes here? Boxes and boxes and boxes of books. I said, well, no, they said it's the book. It's come a month early <laughs> because it was done. It was done so well. So huge thank you to Laura. That's the very important Mexican connection. And what I find fascinating about Mexican politics, in many ways, and no doubt we'll come on to this, is that Mexico has had a broadly consistent, non-aligned position internationally, has always supported the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, has always voted at the UN for ceasefires, for peace processes and so on, and all this despite your rather noisy neighbour up north 
who um, has a very, very different <laughs> approach to things. And so I, I think that very important tradition and the way in which, yes, Mexico has internal human rights problems. I'm very, very well aware of that, as I'm sure you are. Mm -hmm. But you also have that great tradition. You gave asylum to all those people that fled from Spain in the mm -hmm. 1930s. And in Veracruz, there's that beautiful monument to them. And in um, Vienna, I don't know if you knew this, there's a place called Mexico Platz in Vienna. Yeah. I was in Vienna one afternoon. I was looking at a map trying to find somewhere. So, Mexico Platz, Mexico Platz. Why <laughs> is there somewhere in Vienna called Mexico Platz? So I went there and looked at it. And why? Because Mexico was the only country in the League of Nations to vote against the Anschluss Pact mm -hmm. of Hitler with Austria. The Anschluss. Mm -hmm. yeah, the Anschluss against Pact. the Anschluss. Oh, yeah. Contra el Anschluss. So, es yeah. el gobierno de Cárdenas el que Car vota en contra del Car Anschluss. Indeed. Es el único mm -hmm. gobierno del planeta mm -hmm. que efectivamente yeah. condenó yeah. la anexión right. a Austria. That's right. Por parte Absolutely. De And likewise, in that same tradition, Mexico welcomed so many people that came from Chile during the coup. Chile. And then I saw a heroic act by um, Ebrard as foreign minister and AMLO as president when um, Evo Morales' life was at risk in the, in the coup in Bolivia, Mexico sent a plane to save him. That's a great tradition. You should be very proud of it. Oh, estamos muy orgullosos. ¿Se va a publicar en español este libro? ¿Hay la idea de publicarlo en español en México? Um, o... What I'll do is speak to some publishers. It's published in uh, English at the moment by uh, Pluto Press in Britain. And Laura, who's um, spearheading this book, oh, well, you shouldn't use the word spearhead, it's a peace book, but uh, leading on this book, um, we'll be looking for publishers to get it out in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got two of okay. <laughs> okay, there's a, there's a, so if we, can we open the bidding war now? You make offers in the sealed envelopes, please. Contrato, por favor, contrato, chicos. Así no funciona. Esto aquí, pero el teléfono. Okay. Okay. Pero hay otro libro también. Hay otro libro. The, the other Traes book. Otro libro. Um, I'm a strong believer that politics is not just about economics. Yes, children need to eat. Yes, children need to be educated. Yes, we need health care. Yes, we need housing. Of course we do. We need all those things. But the human beings are naturally creative and inspirational. And they express themselves in different ways through music, through art, through poetry, many, many things. And um, I've often, and still do, used poetry in speeches that I make. I, I, I think of the, of the image I'm trying to put forward and I quote an appropriate poet. And it sometimes sets people thinking. And I did this at my first speech as leader of the Labour Party in 2015. And I quoted um, the Nigerian writer Ben Okri. And, Maybe I should have told him I was going to do it beforehand. And then, but he said, he sent me a message saying, why have I been, I've, as soon as you made that quote, I've been inundated with messages and it's helping my books to sell very well. <laughs> and so he then said, would you like to do a discussion with me about African and European literature? I said, well, I don't think anybody will come, but yeah, all right. And we did. 3,000 people came for one and a half hours of Ben and I discussing African and European literature and poetry. And then these ideas developed. And so with my friend Len McCluskey, who used to be the leader of one of the biggest unions in Britain, Unite the Union, um, who also loves poetry, um, we decided to put a book together called Poetry for the Many because our slogan was, for the many, not the few. Mm -hmm. And so we put this together. Len and I chose most of the poems, but other people chose them as well. Some people extremely well known, such as uh, Michael Rosen, who is a very famous British, particularly children's poet. So we, we put this collection together, and we've taken it on tour. And we're getting very big audiences come to events just to talk about poetry and bring their own poems with them. Mm. So I say, who's got a poem here? And children under 10 have all got poems. Yeah. Children under 10 have all got poems. Teenagers, ooh. <laughs> and I, I sort of look at them and say, I think you've got a poem hiding away somewhere there. Come on, let's have it. And they read them out. And so it then becomes cool. 
to write a poem and talk about it. And so this poetry book, it was a pleasure putting it together. The hard part was choosing the poems, but there's a big Mexican connection. Okay. The great poet, Sawana Inez de la Cruz, has a poem in here. Hombre, now, uh, I was in uh, Ameca Meca two days ago. <laughs> at, at, uh, I think you've all heard about her, but she hasn't been heard about much in Europe. And so we have this um, fantastic poem by her called You Foolish Men. You Foolish Men. Hombres necios que acusáis a la mujer sin razón. Ese. Hombres necios. Quote it. Hombres necios que acusáis a la mujer sin razón, sin ver que sois la ocasión de lo mucho que culpáis. De lo mismo es, que culpáis. De lo mismo que culpáis. Mm -hmm. Es un poema fantástico. Clásico, eh, bueno. Clásico, es el más It's conocido. It's an absolutely brilliant poem. So we put it in the book, and most people in Europe and Britain have never heard of Sir Juan Inés de la Cruz, much to their, much to their shame. And so uh, we put it in the book, and I normally... I read it or somebody else reads it at the events we go to. And despite it being written, obviously, not in English, it translates very, very well. And um, the Mexican ambassador to Britain, my friend Yosefa, is having an event at the embassy in honor of Sir Juana Inez de la Cruz with this book. So she is, but what an amazing woman, an amazing writer, an amazing story. And she wrote what? Uh, more than a hundred years earlier than Mary Wollstonecraft wrote the treatise on the rights of women. Secret. So she was like, well, uh, and I don't think Mary Wollstonecraft ever knew anything about Zawana. I There's no evidence she did. But so we're proud to have it there. No, y la historia de Sor Juana, además, es increíble porque era mm. la mente más brillante de toda la Nueva España y los... Uh, era, era un, un, un universo totalmente patriarcal y machista uh -huh. y la tuvieron que refundir en un convento para que dejara de molestar. Pero Su era, historia espantosa. Era, era tan famosa en su época. But, Laura explains to me, she was... Yeah. Laura chose the poem. She was original, then she eventually was thrown out of the convent sí, and claro. she died from a disease no. she picked up from nursing homeless poor people. She picked up a sí, plague sí, sí. And, di and died from that and died so young. We were in um, the Hacienda a few days ago because I've been there before. We got married there, in fact. And um, we just went to the Museum of Her Life. What a beautiful place. Every child should go there. <laughs> sí, por <laughs> supuesto. Bueno, pero lo que es interesante es, lo que, es que lo que estás planteando es que eh, la poesía tiene que ser, puede ser parte de la política y es un activo muy importante para incluso la agitación de ideas, ¿no? Y no solo, yeah. la, poe no solo yeah. la poesía, las artes en general. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, art and artistic freedoms are very, very important. And I think what's interesting about Mexico's approach to art, culture, and history, you probably don't realize it because you live here, is so different to what happens in other parts of the northern part of the Americas. You have um, great protection of the Aztec and the Maya, what you describe as ruins, I describe them as memories, but also the pre-Inca and pre-Maya stuff. Amazing. And there's this pride and understanding in that. And um, the murals of particularly Diego Rivera, but also the painter Frida Kahlo, and the poetry of Tevye Paz and so many others, fantastic. And. Uh, I think it, that does a lot to sort of form, thing, form cultural ideas. And so I was trying, as leader of the <coughs> Labour Party, to think, well, what can a government do to improve artistic endeavour? And so I hit on this idea of a national fund protected from all other competition to be provided in every single school so that every child could get art, music, and theater education. Absolutely. So, because I'm involved with a number of um, amateur theater groups for young people. We've got one, we call it Angel Shed, after a place called The Angel. You've got an angel here as well. And um, what we do is we accept any child. Any child can come. If they want to come, they come. They write their own plays, and they perform them every three months. No charge. We raise the money to fund it. We employ people to do it, and we get hundreds of kids come along. Fantastic. And you see children who are doing pretty badly in school 
often come from very difficult home environments, sometimes have learning difficulties or disabilities. You put them on the stage to be somebody else. You know, you're on the stage, you're on the stage, you're now a bus driver, or you're now a police officer, or you're now a refuse sweeper, mm -hmm. or you're now a teacher, or something, whatever it is. And it changes them, it gives them an image of what they can achieve for themselves. It's, em it's empowering. That's what art and culture should be, empowering. Todo eso me, 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 me recuerda. Uno de mis eh, directores de cine favoritos es Ken Loach. Recuerdo haber visto la primera película que vi de él fue Raining Stones, en los noventas. Y me, 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 me gustó mucho porque yo creo que nadie como él retrataba lo que era la sociedad en Inglaterra en la época de Margaret Thatcher uh -huh. y los problemas de los trabajadores uh -huh. en ese entonces. Uh -huh. y, y ha sido así, todo su, todas sus películas. Eh, tiene una que sucede en Los Ángeles con, uh -huh. con mexicanos uh -huh. trabajando allá y que forman un sindicato. Uh -huh. Es, es esta, esta mirada siempre a la gente. ¿no? lo que tú llamas the common people, mm. ¿no? que, que es lo importante finalmente. Entonces yeah. también aquí se, yeah. se mezcla un poco, o no un poco, se mezcla totalmente lo que es el arte para esto, ¿no? para la política y para la gente, que es lo importante. Mm. Para eso sirve la política, para la gente. ¿No es así? Es el social realism de Ken, que es fantástico. Es un buen amigo mío, y hablo con él frecuentemente. And I've seen most of his films, and I've done some stuff with him. And we asked him to make a film for us for an action campaign. He did this beautiful film about what society mm -hmm. could be like. It was all about hope. And uh, his, his work in uh, films such as The Wind That Shakes the Barley, um, I think about Ireland and so much more. They're quite brutal at times, mm -hmm. quite real. De España. In, in, in the Spanish mm -hmm. Civil War, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. And he did another one called um, I, Daniel Blake, which mm -hmm. is about the brutality of the um, British benefit system. And it was um, mm -hmm. produced, uh, and you know, the opening night was at a very big cinema in London's West End. And so there's a whole crowd of us who had been given invitations by Ken to come and see the opening night. So we're all waiting outside, and somebody comes out from the cinema and says with a loud hailer, can you all form an orderly queue, please? Form a queue. Okay. Said, right, those in receipt of state benefits come to the front. You will get the priority seats. Those that are homeless come to the very front because you will get the best seats. <laughs> so the whole idea was the reverse process. And the film, absolutely fantastic. Ken is... A, a great man, and what I love about Ken is that he's won the Palm d'Or several times, and he's just a totally decent, normal guy. Go, mm -hmm. I go to, I've seen him at his house and many places. <laughs> I know him very well. And in the recent general election campaign, we had a, an open air rally in one of our housing estates in my constituency. Who was the guest speaker? Ken Loach. <laughs> Ah, está buenísima esta charla. Tenemos otra película que ver, aparte del corte comercial, que es la estupenda colaboración de Cintia Bolio, La Chamuca, y ahorita regresamos. No se vayan. Querido lectorado, ¿qué tal? ¿Cómo te me va? ¿Qué tal el clima? ¿Consideras tú que el derecho a la educación de las niñas es un peligro para México? Digo, ¿para los hombres? Pues así las cosas en Afganistán, país al que hoy haremos un viaje trágico y medieval. Y sí, ¿quiénes somos para criticar al patriarcado? Que ya tú sabes que no existe. Pero tres largos años han pasado desde que el Talibán arrebató el derecho humano a la educación a todas las mujeres y niñas mayores de 12 años, instaurando de facto el apartheid o segregación en razón de sexo. Como breviario cultural, aquí sucedió, pero durante la colonia. Sabemos que nuestra prodigiosa Juana de Asbaje, nombre código Sor Juana, pidió vestirse de hombre para ir a la escuela cuando la biblioteca de casa ya no satisfacía la demanda intelectual de la niña curiosa. La adoramos. 
como tal, el derecho a la educación para toda la humanidad se establece en la Carta de Derechos Humanos de la ONU en 1948, por lo que nos sorprendió la secuela de víboras en un avión, talibanes en la ONU, en la cumbre de julio que excluyó, pero claro, a las afganas por lo que vale recordar esta evolución social frente a la involución permitida a dicho gobierno. Tres largos años de este atropello y la comunidad internacional, esa que vocifera que es la buenita, lo ha permitido sin sanciones. Un millón y medio de niñas no pueden ir a la escuela y en suma el 80% de las mujeres han sido despojadas de todo tipo de instrucción. Los niños también sufren por la prohibición de mujeres docentes. Siempre necesarias, no hay suficientes maestras. La burca se diversifica. Tras la gran cumbre, se les obliga a salir acompañadas de un hombre. No pueden viajar solas. Y en el colmo del abuso, el Talibán prohíbe a las mujeres emitir sonido. No pueden hablar en el espacio público y si se les escucha cantar desde sus casas, son castigadas. Para el placer del macho masturbatorio promedio, en las redes se intercambian los videos en los que se observan grupos de hombres azotando a una mujer para después felicitarse los valientes. Pero, si el patriarcado no existe, ¿qué es esta violencia física, psicoemocional, feminicida o digital? Apenas se está haciendo notar una insurgencia de asociaciones civiles, feministas y activistas internacionales que denuncian al régimen talibán por sus políticas estilo apartheid en Sudáfrica o Palestina pero en razón de sexo para que sea definido como crimen de lesa humanidad. Apenas la Unión Europea, esa que no hace nada por Gaza, ha dictaminado el estatus de grupo perseguido a las refugiadas afganas para obtener asilo. Querido lectorado, va la invitación a darles voz, pues las niñas y las mujeres de Afganistán tienen derecho a la educación y a una vida digna y libre de violencia. Chaito. I'll bet Jeremy Corbyn will be glad when this election is over so he can go back to wearing his commie hat. What is a commie hat? I wear a cap. It's a bit like when I was told I was riding a Maoist bicycle. It's a bicycle! University education free to anyone. I'm almost tempted. But on reflection, who will play for this? Jeremy Corbyn still thinks there's a magic money tree. Yeah, there is. In the Cayman Islands. Oh God, this is bad. Anyone else starting to find Jeremy Corbyn really sexy? <laughs> Seguimos aquí en Chamuco TV. Estamos platicando una muy muy interesante plática con Jeremy Corbyn. Jeremy, tú estás muy cercano a América Latina. Siento que eres un enamorado de, de Latinoamérica. Eh, es, está, estuviste muy cercano en todos estos cambios de poderes que ha habido recientemente y que la mayoría, afortunadamente, o varios de ellos, afortunadamente, ha sido de gobiernos progresistas hacia la izquierda, sí, eh, sí. en Chile, en, en eh, Colombia. Eh, ¿Cómo has visto en general todo esto, todo este cambio reciente en, en América Latina? Y sobre todo comparándolo con lo que sucede en, en Europa. ¿Crees que esto abona más a esta esperanza de la que hablas? interest and visits in Latin America. I spent um, two years as a young man living in the Caribbean as a volunteer worker there. And then I went off on my own, visiting a number of countries in the southern part of Latin America, particularly Chile, Argentina, Peru, Bolivia, Brazil. And um, 
I've maintained that um, interest ever since. And uh, I'm overall very encouraged by what is happening, by the movements for greater social justice, um, but also very well aware of the power of right-wing forces in Latin America to challenge any government that tries to bring about changes. I mean, look at the history of Brazil from... I first went to Brazil in 1968, 69, thereabouts. Military dictatorship, utterly brutal behaviour and people and treatment of them. And eventually, Brazil ends up electing Lula as a trade union person as the president. That didn't come from nowhere. That came from years of work by the movement of landless people and of the PT, the Workers' Party, in, in Brazil, which is not just a political party, it's more of a social movement, and I'm fascinated by that process. And, so, um, and then when um, the modern form of coup took place, which is the legal coup, lawfare, and got rid of um, Lula and put him in prison, several hundred days in prison, he didn't give up, people didn't give up, came out of prison and re-elected president. I was there for the election amazing thing. And he's up against huge, powerful forces. Bolsonaro represents the very richest and most powerful, who are destroying the natural environment, taking the money away from the poorest people, all, all that. So I've got a lot of respect and admiration for them. So I do think there's overall a move to more redistributive radical politics across Latin America, but it's not an even path. I mean, look at Peru, goes up and down, look at the tensions that are in uh, Bolivia at the moment, and um, look at the problems that new governments, such as in Honduras, face with very powerful people trying to prevent them making progress. Uh, obviously, we're in Mexico, and I know Mexico probably better than most other countries in Latin America. I don't consider myself an expert in anything. But I'm very pleased that um, we're now inaugurating a new president, Claudia. First woman, Jewish woman, president of Mexico. Congratulations. <laughs> There's a lot of work to be done. A lot of work to be done on many, many issues in Mexico, but the direction it's going is the good one. Oye, tú hablaste del lofer que se le hizo a Lula, pero a ti también te hicieron guerra judicial. A ti te hicieron guerra mediática y guerra judicial. De qué tamaño? Cuéntanos. <laughs> well, I had um, media attacks on me from the very beginning. I mean, some of them were just completely mad. I mean, one of them said that. ¿Cuáles son uh, los más ridículos? <laughs> well, um, los medios two. Los, los, los ataques, ataques más ridículos. ridículos. <laughs> o ambos. ¿Cuáles son los peores? Los más, los más absurdos. The, as an eight-year-old boy. Yes. I had a pogo stick. Okay. Do you know you know what a pogo stick is? Yeah. It's oh. where you it's it. you stand on it. Oh, yeah. see, yeah. 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 I had a pogo stick, yeah. and on Christmas Day, I killed somebody's rabbit with the pogo stick. Okay. <laughs> El día de Navidad. As an eight-year-old. Pero saltando. No, sí, wow. Jeremy Corbyn, the asesino. Only, <laughs> the only. only That's right, Jeremy Corbyn, the rabbit publicó? assassin. The only problem was I never had a pogo stick and I never killed a rabbit. But apart from that, the story was fine. And then there were other ones which um, claimed that I rode a, a Maoist bicycle. And, I, and so they then put a cartoon of me in a sort of Maoist uniform with a high collar here and the cap on and so on riding a bicycle, and they claimed I was riding a Maoist bicycle. Una bicicleta Maoista. Yes, Maoista. I mean, wow. I thought bicycles were basically pretty neutral politically, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, they then said, Mr. Corbyn, how do you deal with this? And I said, I'm very interested in what you say. The bicycle, yeah, you've got a point there. The only problem is, from your point of view, It's made in the other part of China. My bicycle was made in Taiwan. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then another one, the BBC, 
decided to have a whole program about how I was under the influence of President Putin. I've never actually met President Putin. The nearest ever came to meeting him was on a protest in support of human rights in Russia while he was being entertained by Tony Blair. But, you know, that's all forgotten. <laughs> and so the BBC had a whole programme with a picture of the Kremlin behind the um, studio discussion, which I was not invited to take part in, with me with a Leninist cap and a red flag in front of the Kremlin. <laughs> Oh, it's completely, uh, at one level, it's so absurd, it's mad. But then you think of the amount of time and energy my media team, myself, have to spend in rebutting this kind of stuff. And that then takes you away from challenging all the issues of poverty and equality and justice and war that you really want to be concentrating on. See, and that's what it does. It's designed to either destroy or ridicule people. And so. We also had our uh -huh. house under siege from the media for five years. Sí, pero years. también está hecho, también está hecho para que la gente deje de creer en la verdad, uh -huh. para que la gente deje de saber qué es lo que es cierto y qué es lo que no es cierto. Yeah. Y lo yeah. que también es increíble es que sí está hecho para eh, eh, están probando su capacidad de hacer narrativas y, 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 y vamos y engañar a la gente. Para decir, todos son iguales. Todos son Entonces, iguales. Entonces, alentar la organización de la gente uh -huh. para, para matar la esperanza. Exactly. Para eso están hechos. That's right. It's all designed to disempower and turn everything into a sort of um, marginalization of anyone that talks in these um, actually very respectable left socialist traditions uh -huh. of how you, you don't bring change by somebody turning up from above, the wizard doesn't bring change. <laughs> what brings change is mobilization and empowerment of people. Claro. And that's what it's about. So it's about education, it's about hope, it's about empowerment. Which, so it's about school students having power. It's about workers having power. My whole project in life is empowering others. Bueno, y hablando del de tema eh, judicial, ¿qué te dijeron a nivel de guerra judicial? ¿Cuál fue la guerra judicial contra ti? Well, lawfare against me has been huge. I've had a number of legal cases launched against me. The biggest one was uh, an allegation of libel against somebody. And um, we fought the case for four years. The case was eventually withdrawn by the um, protagonist, and I was left with a bill of almost a million pounds. Wow. Which I had to raise money for to pay it off. And I was able to raise that money by appealing to people. And all the donations were five pounds, 10 pounds, 20 pounds, that sort of thing. So we've, we've got through that. But the legal attacks, it's a new tactic by the right all over the world, lawfare. Look at what was done against Lula. Look what was done um, Correa. In, in Correa in Ecuador. Uh, he's got, what, 90 cases still against him, I believe? Uh, I mean, he and I were having a joke about who'd got the most legal cases against, uh, against us. We're having a sort of kind of macabre humor. We're having coffee together in Brussels. I said, come on, how many cases have you got against you? I said, oh, really? Um, and so, yes, it's the new form. It's, uh, it's lawfare that is being used. Um, and then you look at that at a wider scale, the use of law to destroy radical movements. Investor state protection law is a very dangerous process mm -hmm. where a country that, for example, a country that wants to take into public ownership its mineral resources and uh, the companies concerned don't want it, they then say they've got investor state protection. They then take those governments to court. The most famous case was Philip Morris Corporation, tobacco company, took the Australian government to court because the Australian government had quite rightly tried to restrict smoking to create a healthier population. Philip Morris took them to court on that. And there's plenty of other cases of investor state protection. So we've got to think very carefully about how we mobilize people and empower people. The real power in this world are what? Yes, of course, military power but it's actually the unaccountable global economic power 
Who controls Google? Who controls Amazon? Who controls Facebook? Who controls the biggest mining companies, Glencore and all the others? And so um, we've got to develop solidarity, which is why the Progressive International has been brought into existence and why we're trying to develop that solidarity. And uh, give an example, the Congo. Biggest country in Africa almost, mm -hmm. biggest level of mineral deposits of any country in Africa, poorest people, children mining coltan and cobalt. And where does that where does that coltan and cobalt end up? In our phones. Mm -hmm. All of our mm -hmm. phones are powered by often minerals mined by children in Africa, are then legitimately sold by mining companies once they've been exported from the Congo. That's just one example of global injustice. Oye, Jeremy, eh, hay un tema que sigue, que sigue presente, lamentablemente, que es el, pues, el genocidio en, en Gaza, eh, los palestinos. ¿Qué, ¿Qué es lo que tú estás viendo eh, como posible escenario en, en los próximos meses, en lo que está pasando ahorita? Acaba de ser rechazado eh, Netanyahu en un discurso de la ONU, eh, por ejemplo, por buena parte de la comunidad de, de los integrantes. Eh, ¿Cómo ves tú lo que está pasando? I've been involved with supporting the Palestinian people all my life, and I've been to Palestine and Israel on nine different occasions. I've been to many of those places, and uh, I've visited schools in Gaza, which are now bombed and destroyed. And I just remember talking to the children in those schools, their joy, their hope, mm -hmm. their belief in a future. Many of them are now dead, and the, their school has been destroyed, and pretty well everything in Gaza has been destroyed. 40,000 people have been killed in, in Gaza. Um, and I think all credit to South Africa. I went on behalf of Progressive International to the um, International Court of Justice in The Hague for the hearing uh, when South Africa brought its case against Israel. And there was some, it was amazing experience. It was bitterly cold, freezing weather. We had to be there at 5.30 in the morning in order to go in, lots of security checks and things, we went in, heard the case, brilliantly presented. And I was thinking, South Africa lived under apartheid from 1948 to 1990, and uh, threw off the yoke of apartheid and the racist regime there, and now is taking Israel to court for genocide against the Palestinian people and won the case. And so international law is on the side of the Palestinians. The International Court of Justice, the International Criminal Court, the uh, Geneva Conventions also. And yet the bombing goes on. Why? Because the US and Europe provide the weapons, provide the bombs and provide it. And so Netanyahu can get away with this stuff because he knows the money and the bombs will continue to come. If the US... Britain, France, Germany just said, no, you're not getting any more weapons, you're not getting any more bombs mm -hmm. until you withdraw. It would stop tomorrow, and they know that. But instead, Israel is now bombing Lebanon, as if Lebanon hasn't suffered enough. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was talking at um, yesterday here in Mexico City with my friend Ofer Kassim. He's a member of the Knesset. Um, he's been suspended from Knesset because he opposes the occupation of Gaza and the West Bank. He is, um, if you like, on the side of justice and the Palestinians. Uh, he has now been suspended from Parliament. But he was telling me how much opposition there is now in Israel to what Netanyahu's doing, because the whole thing has become a war about Netanyahu. The war goes on because it keeps him in office. Once the war stops, he's out of office and probably in prison for corruption. How many more Palestinian and Lebanese lives have got to be lost for the vanity of Netanyahu and this project of destroying Palestinian identity and nationhood? I've been talking to Palestinians yesterday and today and so on, and uh, we've just got to do everything we can and um, mount the demonstrations. because Sometimes I feel very frustrated, and we, you get home from another demonstration in London, and you think, well... And then get a call from somebody in Gaza or the West Bank who just says, thank you. The fact you lot are out on the streets in London, in Mexico, in New York, in Buenos Aires or wherever, gives us hope. 
Uy. Uy. Oye, Jeremy, eh, recuerdo algo que comentaste alguna vez de una niña en, en un campo de refugiados en Siria que tú le preguntaste, ¿qué quiere ser de grande? Y ella dijo, doctora. Yeah. Y, y eso, eso te dio yeah. mucha esperanza y yo creo que esa es la esperanza que, 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 que tú tienes y que nos das a todos y esa, ese optimismo que nos das. Sí. Muchísimas gracias por, por esta entrevista. Realmente sí, sí es muy esperanzadora. Muchas gracias, Jeremy. Muchísimas bienvenido a gracias, México. Bienvenido a México. Y bienvenido a tu libro, ¿eh? <risa> <risa> en verdad. Es pero el absolute pleasure, and I love the cartoons all around us. So it's, uh, this is the best set I've ever been on, I think. And thank you very much for allowing me gracias. to come onto your program. And what a pleasure this conversation has been. Muchísimas gracias por todos y buena suerte el pueblo de México una futura, a futura, futura de igualdad y oportunidad por todos los jóvenes. Gracias. Muchas gracias. gracias. Muchas gracias y buena suerte a Gran Bretaña también. Gracias. Sí, buena suerte, buena suerte. Es necesito. Sí. Buena suerte, Gran Bretaña. Muchas gracias, señoras y señores. Sí, necesita activarse. Para compartir, comentar, coleccionar. Ya lo sabe. Cuídense mucho y nos vemos a la próxima. Chao, chao. Adiós. Bye. Bye.